now we, in a way, in a certain sense, step into a minefield here when we go down this avenue. But it is important, it's necessary, um, because there are depths, there are levels. Ancient Jewish sages believed there were levels in Scripture. And I'm convinced, and some of the great, in fact, some of the scholars of old believed there were levels in Scripture. But trying to uncover or plumb the depths of those levels is what's the problem. So when I talk about this fourth um, pillar, it's probably, it, not probably, it is, without any doubt, as important as the other three. But it opens up what I call dimensions, dimensions. And I became fascinated with dimensions in Scripture from a young Christian in the 80s. In fact, it led me to looking into a number of things, which I won't talk about here. One of them I will is that I became quite interested in, very basically, obviously, in quantum physics, because I saw principles and things there that are... Are, are biblical. It's very, very interesting, the development of quantum mechanics. And you look into things that just really prove God and show God. Uh, the problem with these physicians, or physicists, sorry, sorry, should I say, is they won't acknowledge God in this. They've now established, or they're claiming, for instance, that the Big Bang is questionable, probably never happened as we've known it historically, or being taught it through the secular schools. They also are now finding that for life to exist on Earth, they, they need carbon, and for that to take place, you have to be an exact distance from the sun and, and so every planet, planet is exactly where it needs to be for life to exist on earth so the earth becomes the center of the existence of life universally and and I mean Christian theologians certainly those that delve into the scientific side of things you know uh, may I can't remember his first name but these are great minds and they've been talking about what we call design, not randomness, for years. And now they're beginning to see this from the study of quantum mechanics or quantum physics. And then it's just, I find it interesting. It doesn't add or subtract from our knowledge of the word. You know, you look at simple things like the, the, um, the atom. And so you begin to quantum physics gets into subatomic particles, and just su such fascinating things come out for me. One of them being that uh, subatomic particles can exist in different states at the same time. Now that's that's like just wow, you know. That speaks of God in creation, and I I could get into a lot of stuff, but I'm, all I'm trying to say is there's more depth than we have delved into but to go down this road and I call this the scripture in its inspired you see aspect all scripture is God breathed all scripture is given by inspiration of God and when something carries the breath of God in it, it there's a sense in which it carries the infinite and infinity in theological terms is there is no limit in any part of his being there's no limit that doesn't we're not saying there's no known limit. No, there is no limit in any aspect or part of his being. And and so the scripture is in in a sense you you can never discover all its depths and 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 levels. However, however, not to get taken off on a tangent into all kinds of things, which is what's happening today. You see, a lot of people today are using, whether deliberately or not, I don't know, but are going down this avenue and giving the scripture all kinds of spiritual, some of it's wacko, some of it's weird, because they're, they're actually, in a sense, abusing this liberty, abusing the liberty that we have. Now, the scripture itself says no scripture is of private interpretation, but all scripture, you see. Now, that's where I'm going.
So yes, the scriptures open. We we that are born of the Spirit, it's true people say the Lord's given me his spirit, and the same spirit that gave the scriptures will interpret it. Yes, there's a of course there's a truth to that, you see. And it's lovely. It's lovely. I was fortunate, I grew up under a ministry that helped me spellbound. And the man was, he, he had sound doctrine, he came out of a Baptist background, so I wouldn't make that 100% sound, but certainly um, there was a sound approach to interpreting scripture by, in many cases, by so-called Baptists. However, he would open up scriptures and, and there was a spiritual context in which he did it, and it was illuminatory, it was revelationary. But that must be be held in place, held together by the other three pillars, the grammatical, the historical, and theological interpretation. So you don't go off and give it some weird meaning, and that's happening today. And as a result of that, there's a, a lot of false teaching around today, and all kinds of claims of God showing and God revealing. Balderdash. The faith movement arose around Balderdash. A lot of it, there's, there's elements of truth in it, elements of truth, yes, and that gives it some kind of plausibility, but for those that are trained and skilled in the word of righteousness, skilled in grammatical, theological and historical interpretation so that they can use those tools to check the revelation, you see, otherwise, how do you hold it in balance, how do you check it? very, very, very important, believe me. So having laid that foundation, and I'll go a little bit further quickly, but having laid that foundation, that you need those three, then I'm taking you now and I'm saying, yes, there is more, far more. And I talk about dimensions. There are dimensions to the scriptures which would take us into Oh, folk, believe me when I tell you, the last few years have been such a thrill for me, so thrilling, and I just want to shout it. I used to have this with my study in theology, as a, I, the very being of God would open up in my understanding, my spiritual understanding. I need to emphasize that. You see, you don't have to be academic to do this. You, you just need to be born of the Spirit. That's true. And there is a level or a percentage of academia involved. There must be. Otherwise, you're going to be talking, you're going to give all kinds of meanings to something which may not be the true meaning. The true meaning. Now, I'm going to expound on all of these things that I'm saying because I want to lead you into an understanding. Open your mind. Open your, your spiritual eyes up to things because that's what this man did for me in my early ministry. Open my spiritual eyes. I wanted to know more. But I wanted the absolute truth. I didn't want some phony, baloney, weird, wacko stuff, you see. But that which led me closer in my relationship to Jesus. And so, you know, you could use the principle of the iceberg, only one-tenth above water. There's nine-tenths hidden, nine scriptural terms. How do you find those nine-tenths? How do you get to them? There is a way. I don't know if we'll ever get to the full nine-tenths, but certainly even if we go one or two-tenths deeper in this, in, under the water, under the, the level of our understanding, deeper into the level of scripture, my goodness. My, without, and again, I kind of keep saying this, without becoming wacko. And believe me, there's a lot of stuff out there today, a lot of stuff, folks. So how do you test it? How do we test the so-called spiritual illumination? How do we test it? And I use Paul. Paul used, he had his background in under a Jewish sage. Paul sat under Gamaliel, and he was schooled in the Old Testament scriptures, the law and the prophets. And his understanding or revelation came out of that knowledge. You see, there was attached to the revelation sound teaching, sound historical teaching, theological and, and grammatical. He was a student of the law, so he knew it, he understood it. And when God opened his understanding for him to be able to write those letters, he says, Unto me has been made known these mysteries that I might make known to you, the mysteries of God. Now, understand something else here. Mysteries is not mysticism. 
there has been of late coming in with the messianic so-called movement. You have people that are schooled in Kabbalah and bringing Jewish mysticism over, which is, is actually the occult. It's the occult. And people follow them and their eyes wide open and they're saying, wow, wow, wow. But the mysteries of the new are theological. They're theological. And so you can open them up through the methods of interpreting, which are theological, grammatical, and historical. You can get, gain a great understanding. I hope I'm making sense here. But it's very important for us. And I'm showing you these things because there is so much more in Scripture. And you need to have that desire to know these things. It's fine to be at a level which is basic. It's fine, you see. A surface grasp of things, it's fine. But it's not enough. You're probably not as mature in Christ as you should be. So we grab into Christ in all things. Let's look at this. In Ephesians in chapter 3, and I'm closing this particular section with this. In Ephesians chapter 3, we get the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height that is involved in our understanding with all the saints that is in the scripture leading us into the full knowledge of Christ. Let me open that up. Chapter 3 of Ephesians verse 17 to 19. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That ye, being rooted and grounded in love. Now remember in Galatians 5 and verse 6 it says love, faith works by love. You can have faith without love. Believe me. Believe me. I've seen plenty of that around over the last number of years in the Christian walk. Faith without love. Faith. You can have faith without works. Faith must have works. But the essence, the grounding, foundation of faith must be love. If you love, for love believeth all things. So faith works by love. That ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend. And this word comprehend is a very deep word. That you may be able to comprehend for your own possession, for your own self, you may comprehend, okay, with all saints, so here we have it, God wants us all to understand these things, it becomes the responsibility of the teacher to help you, to open up those understandings, to lead you into the understanding, but you need to come into the full knowledge, the full understanding and the true knowledge, listen to me carefully, the true knowledge of Christ which pass uh, with all saints. What is the breadth and length and depth and height? What do we have there? We have dimensions, a container, Christ, infinite again, you see. And to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. In him, Colossians tells us, dwelleth the 2.9, dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead. He is Emmanuel, God with us. There's no limitations in any part of his being. If we grow up into him, we must grow up into him dimensionally. Length, breadth, depth and height. Most of us grow up in a unidimension, single dimension, because we belong to a particular denomination that insists that they have all truth and we must only listen to them. Well, I found that not to be true. I, uh, <laughs> I didn't make many friends for myself on this path, believe me. Because when you join a particular church, they want you to sign on the dotted line and be true to what they teach. The fact that there are others and other thoughts and other dimensions to it, they won't allow you to look into. You have to be a parrot to belong to a denomination, you see. So... What happens now is, let's go a little bit further, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Emmanuel, God with us. Grow up into Christ in all things, in all four dimensions, not a unidimensional. Dimensional. 
And when you grab in all dimensions, you grab into the fullness of Christ, which is the fullness of the Godhead, which means you experience. Oh, there's so much I have to teach you and share with you in these things. And all he says, for all saints, comprehend with all saints. This wasn't meant for an elite few. This is my message. This is my ministry. You say there's more. And some of you, many, have taken and followed on with so-called revelation truth, which has actually led you, I don't even want to say, okay, I don't want to say, I'm not here to pull down, but believe me, it was a dangerous thing that was done. And when I looked at the theology, theological things that were being said, it was hair-raising, absolutely hair-raising. So what am I saying? When you do step out into revelation knowledge, you see, you must have something that is like a compass in your life to see whether you're on, on, on target, whether you're out. And those are the first three pillars. Grammatical, sorry, historical, grammatical, and theological. Now one more thing in closing this particular section. There are also Five schools of interpreting prophecy, some say four. I'll explain that. Likewise, likewise, you see, there are these four pillars. Um, and the different schools of interpreting, that is, you have, uh, and I'm not going to get into that too much. I'll do a teaching on each one of those schools. You have the pre you have the historical, you have the spiritual or allegoric, allegorical, or you, and you have the futurist. Now, when you only belong to one of those, you're unidimensional. Makes sense. Unidimensional. A single side or dimension is not a container. It's exactly that. It's just a single dimension. You don't have the breadth, you don't have the height, and you do not have the depth. You cannot contain the fullness of Christ. And the ministry was supposed to bring people into the fullness of Christ, to grow up into Him in all things, that we might, as a body of believers, be containers of Christ and the glory of Christ. Well, I've said a lot. Uh, you might have to listen a few times. And I can't go into all of this, but I'm certainly going to lay certain truths out for you in dimensions and then take you into some of those depths in the scriptures. God bless you. And I must uh, say something in closing. I must give, pay tribute to a man that influenced me in this. His name was, I believe he's a professor, Lemma Duplessis, who got me thinking in my early Christian life, besides my own pastor, and a man called Doc Prinsloo. These were the three great influences. The last two, the latter two, Doc Prinsloo and Lemma Duplessis, um, were lecturers in the Bible school where I studied, or theological college where I studied, and my pastor was the man who opened my spiritual eyes to the most incredible truths. I owe these men a debt of, thank a, a debt of thanksgiving. And I bless God for the influence in my life. Amen and amen.